Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 22. It's the introduction to the spirochetes. We're going to talk about syphilis, Lyme disease, and leptospirosis, their causative agents, their clinical presentations, how we diagnose and treat them. Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 22. We're going to talk about spirochetes. Spirochetes are gram-negative, long, thin, helical, and motile organisms that have axial filaments which aid in locomotion, and they also the axial filaments reside between the peptidoglycan layer and the outer membrane. They run parallel as kind of axles to help it rotate and move. The most nefarious spirochete is Treponema pallidum. This is the causative agent for syphilis. It's not intracellular. It's gram-negative, and it's not reliably seen on gram stain. But if you do dark field microscopy, you can see it moving around. It's not culturable. Transmission of syphilis is either congenital, genital, uh, or sexual. Uh, in utero, congenital syphilis is contracted or during birth. With congenital syphilis, you have transplacental, transplacental transmission after the first trimester. If treated during the first trimester, then you're okay. The child with congenital syphilis often has a bloody nasal discharge called sizzle, snuffles. They have abnormal leg bones and saber shins, Hutchinson's teeth, which are characteristic. They'll have a saddle nose deformity and a perforated palate. Primary syphilis shows up with a primary lesion, which is a chancre. It usually lasts 10 to 60 days. It's an area of ulceration and inflammation, but it's painless. If you do a culture from that ulcer, you're going to see many organisms under dark field microscopy. Secondary syphilis happens 2 to 10 weeks later. It indicates systemic spread of the spirochete, and you have kind of malaise and flu-like symptoms. Characteristically, in secondary syphilis, you'll get a maculopapular rash. It can involve the palms and soles. There are only a few rashes that involve the palms and soles, and so having a short list of those rashes is helpful. Syphilis is the number one on your list. You can get condylomalata, which are flat warts in the groin and axilla, and you get many organisms circulating throughout the body. Then it kind of quiets down and resolves until you have tertiary syphilis, which can show up 30 years later, several years later. It's rare. 30% of people who are untreated develop these symptoms. You can get gummas, which are destructive lesions of bone and soft tissues due to peripheral neuropathy. You can have aortitis or proximal aortic aneurysm. You can have central nervous, in, in, central nervous system involvement, such as the posterior columns or dorsal columns, which gives you tavies dorsalis. You can get generalized paresis. You can get a delayed hypersensitivity, and frequently the tertiary syphilis is difficult to diagnose because there are few organisms, and it's controlled by the immune response. So the question is, what stage of syphilis has a diffuse maculopapular rash? The answer is the second stage. For a lab diagnosis, we're not able to culture Treponema pallidum, so we rely upon dark, dark microscopy when we have a, a tissue sample. We'll see motile organisms that are brightly lit up against a dark backdrop. We have conventional light microscopy, which is not very good, and we can do fluorescent microscopy with a direct fluorescent antibody. More and more commonly, we rely upon serology to diagnose syphilis. With syphilis serology, we have a non-treponemal non and treponemal tests. The non-treponemal tests are good screening methods. They're not specific for treponemal pallidum, and they can have false positives. And that's called the RPR and the VDRL. Both of these tests are positive in primary syphilis and secondary syphilis. You'll get antibodies to cardiolipin, which can give you a false positive. Treponemal tests are more specific. They're good for confirmatory tests. And these are antibodies to specific treponemal antigens, such as the microhemagglutinin and treponema pallidum, or MHATP, and the fluorescein treponemal antibody absorption test, FTA-ABS. These are more specific and less likely to have false positives. Treatment and prevention of syphilis, unfortunately we don't have any vaccine which prevents us from, from getting it. When you do diagnose syphilis, you treat it with penicillin G or ceftriaxone. And the amount and duration depends on how bad and what stage the disease is in. So if you have a question on step one where you diagnose the patient with syphilis and you treat them appropriately with penicillin G and then they get worse immediately after treatment, that's often called the Jerish-Herxheimer reaction. As the syphilis organisms are being destroyed, 
they release their bad humors into the body and the body has a worsening reaction so you can get hypotension you can get fever you can get a rash and you worry because you wonder that you did the wrong thing but you've done the right thing and you keep on treating and they'll get better Borrelia is the next organism we're going to talk about these are also spirochetes they're gram-negative and they're microaerophilic. Borrelia burgdorferi is a causative agent of Lyme disease Transmission for Lyme disease depends on a tick bite from an infected tick which transmits the disease. This is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. The tick involved is Ixodes scapularis or also Ixodes damini. It's the main vector in the Northeast and Midwest. Usually the nymphs spread the disease and they require two days of feeding to transmit an infected dose. The pathogenesis of Lyme disease is that the tick invades your skin and you get primary disease. Borrelia, the spirochete, enters your bloodstream, and then, then it involves the heart and the CNS, which is secondary Lyme disease, and tertiary Lyme disease is immune complex disease, which can cause arthritis and nerve de deficits and other problems. The clinical findings depend on the stage involved, so Lyme disease is one of those staged diseases, and knowing each of the stages is going to be important. The classic primary stage is an erythematous skin rash, called erythema migrans or erythema chronica migrans. You'll get what you have is a target lesion of erythema and in the center you'll have a paler area where the rash used to be. You'll also have neurologic findings such as malaise and you can get a polyarteritis. Clinical findings in stage one are usually localized to the skin during the first month. Stage two represents dissemination during two to three months after infection. Here you get another rash you get lymphadenopathy, malaise, and a men mild meningoencephalitis. Others include intermittent and constantly changing symptoms. You can get a lymphocytic meningoencephalitis with cranial nerve palsies, and if you have a bilateral Bell's palsy, Lyme disease is the number one cause of that. It can attack the heart and cause AV block in up to 10% of patients. Stage 3 Lyme disease is characterized by an arthritis and neuropathies and memory loss. You can also get acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans. Treatment for Lyme disease includes early diagnosis and antibiotic therapy. If you catch it early and treat it right, it's curable. You can give amoxicillin or doxycycline. If you have late, waited till it's secondary or tertiary Lyme disease, antibiotic administration is ineffective. The question is, what stage of Lyme disease has erythema migraines? The answer is the first stage. Lab diagnosis for Lyme disease often it depends upon serum or CSF antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi. IgM is particularly helpful for recent onset disease. Lab strains grow extremely slowly and so we're not likely to culture it. We need the body fluids or the tissue samples to do the antibody tests on, but we almost never see growth. Diagnosis is often clinical. You can get a reactive arthritis similar to Reiter's syndrome or rheumatic fever, where you have arthritic symptoms and other non-arthritic symptoms from Lyme disease. It often resembles rheumatoid arthritis. Let's do a question. A 39-year-old female presents with complaints of fever, malaise, and arthralgias for 10 days. She reveals that she recently returned from a family camping trip in New Hampshire two weeks ago. On physical exam, you find a swollen, indurated area on her left leg. The lesion has a central clear area that's surrounded by an erythematous ring. The causative agent is, and so we have here the classic description of primary Lyme disease or stage one Lyme disease. You have the rash of chronic erythematous, you have erythema migrans, uh, and you have a, a spo exposure to ticks on your camping trip. So we know that it's Borrelia burgdorferi, and so we don't see that on the list. We know it's not a bacillus or a coccus. It's not a vibrio or a virus, and so it's got to be a spirochete. We have then B. hermsii and B. recurrentis, which are causes of relapsing fever, and there are less than 100 cases of this per year in the United States. You have transmission through ticks, again with B. hermsii, through a rodent host, or lice with B. recurrentis through a human host. Relapsing fever is also due to the immune response that, de that develops to the antigen present presented. You have the disease that regresses, and then you have new antigens expressed that you don't have immunity to, and so the disease reappears. And that's why it's relapsing fever. Diagnosis depends 
on blood smear, basically. We can't culture Borrelia, and we can't do a serologic test for, for recurrent fever, so we have to get the blood smear and look for the organisms that are motile. The next organism is Leptospira interrogans. These are thin spirochetes, they're gram negatives, and they often have a hook formation. They look like a question mark. Leptospirosis is uncommon, with less than 100 cases in the United States per year. And the symptoms are flu-like with myalgias, but you can get severe systemic disease in the kidney, in the brain, in the eye. You can also get wheel disease, which is jaundice, renal failure, and hemorrhage. Transmission for leptospirosis uh, comes from infected urine uh, of rodents and farm animals that gets into the water. And then we go out and we're, in the, we're kayaking in the streams, or we have exposure to contaminated water, and we have a break in our skin, and that's how leptospira gets in. Lab diagnosis is based on serology. This is the most readily culturable of the spirochetes. Remember, we couldn't, we couldn't culture for syphilis, we can't culture for Lyme disease, uh, but we can try to culture for leptospirosis, but it's still pretty difficult. Treatment is penicillin G, just like with syphilis, or we could do doxycycline for Lyme disease, like with Lyme disease, and we can vaccinate livestock to, present, to prevent the spread. Let's do a question. A 26-year-old sexually active female presents to you for evaluation of a centimeter-long painful ulcer on her right labium majoris. You also notice a right-sided inguinal lymphadenopathy and that is tender to palpation. The causative agent for this patient illness is, so we have a sexually transmitted disease with a painful ulcer and we have pain, painful lymphadenopathy in the inguinal region. The ulcer is going to trick you and try to think of syphilis, but that ulcer is painless. And so we have to remember that Haemophilus ducre is a common form of chancroid, which is a painful ulcer. Next, you are working at the VA when a Vietnam vet presents to you for evaluation of altered mental status. His son is concerned that his behavior has become increasingly odd. You immediately notice that he has an ataxic gait when he walks into the exam room. On physical exam, you find that his pupils can accommodate, but they don't respond to light. His sensory exam reveals loss of vibratory sensation and proprioception in his lower extremities. Serology is positive for VDRL. You diagnose him with tabes dorsalis, a form of tertiary syphilis that affects the... So this could be a neurology question. Uh, if you have all these neurologic symptoms with an ataxic gait and decreased vibratory sense and sensation, and even if you didn't know your microbiology, you would know that that detects the posterior columns. The pupil findings they describe are the classic description for the Argyle Robertson pupil. It reacts, but it accommodates, but does not react. That's a neurology-based uh, syphilis question that needs you, you need to be able to be familiar with your posterior column disease. Next question. A 13-year-old male is brought to you for left-sided facial paralysis. On physical exam, you note a swollen, erythematous knee that's both warm and tender to palpation. The patient states that he had similar symptoms in his shoulder two weeks ago. He denies being sexually active or any recent trauma. He reports that he hiked the Appalachian Trail the previous summer. This patient is most likely infected with... So this is a classic case of Lyme disease. The clues that we have is the recent exposure to the Appalachian Trail in his hiking last summer. It's not primary disease, so he doesn't have erythema chronica migrans, but he does have secondary disease with his arthritis, his migratory arthritis, in the shoulder first and then on the knee. He doesn't have any sexual activity, so you don't think about a gonococcal arthritis or a traumatic arthritis. So we know that this is Lyme disease and we know that it's Borrelia burgdorferi. A nine-year-old boy presents to you with an abrupt onset of fevers, myalgias, headache, and nausea. He reports one sick contact, a neighbor whom he goes swimming with at a nearby pond. Physical exam is notable for conjunctivitis and hepatomegaly. Labs reveal elevated transaminases and bilirubin. Urinalysis is positive for proteinuria, granular casts, and microscopic hematuria. These boys are most likely infected with... This is a hard one. Uh, you'll need to remember about leptospirosis. It's one, of the, it's one of the spirochetal diseases that involves the liver and the kidneys with a fever and a headache and involves exposure to contaminated water. Okay, syphilis you're not going to get from the water and Lyme disease you're not going to get from the water. So you're not going to have recurrent fever or syphilis in A and B. You're not going to have Legionnaire's disease, which is not transmitted by water directly, but through aerosol sprays, through contaminated air systems. And again, it's not Lyme disease because he doesn't have a tick bite. So he's got leptospirosis, which is choice C. 
Wrapping up module 22, this is one you're going to want to study a lot and go back and look over again. Syphilis is always tested on step one. It has protein manifestations. It has characteristic testable diseases with different blood tests which range depending on the disease stage you're in. You should know about treponema pallidum, the dark field test, how to diagnose it, and you should know about treatment for syphilis, including the jarish herxheimer reaction. Lyme disease also comes up as a staged disease with a peculiar life cycle including the deer mice and the deer tick. You should be familiar with the different stages, when you get a Bell's palsy, when you get the migrating rash. And finally we talked about leptospirosis. Uncommon, but look for it in people who have exposure to wild water and where urine of a different animals has been infected. Next up we're going to go to module 23 where we'll talk about chlamydial diseases.